My name is Lynn Dyer, and welcome to the National Armor and Cavalry Restoration Shop. The first tank is called Mother, introduced literally in 1915. And, and that's going to be the first Mark I is Mother. But it's based off of Caterpillar track design systems, which were developed here in the United States in the late 1880s. Several different farming companies like Holt, uh, American Tractor, basically built different types of tractors for farm use, pulling plows and other types of farm implements. And that's where the foundation came along to place an armor box on it, and then eventually weapon systems. When you start looking at that, then you go to the first tank that was actually the first prototype British tank, Little Willie. Square box, no change in, in the shapes, just a, a square box with a Caterpillar track system underneath it for propulsion, and mostly machine guns will become the foundation. The British tank behind me is a British Mark V Star. This particular tank was used by the American 301st Heavy Tank Battalion in the First World War. During the First World War, John Pershing realized the need for armored vehicles. He tasked Samuel D. Rockenbaugh to become the Chief of the Armor Corps, supporting the American Expeditionary Forces. It was broken down into three primary organizations. There was a light tank school at Sumer with the French Renault tanks at Sumer, and then they had the British Heavy Tank School at Bovington as a focal point for the heavy tank component, training with the British tank forces. The third component is the tank replacement school at Camp Colt, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Now, out of this, three individuals will be the primary leaders at each one of those schoolhouses. Captain Patton will be with the French Light Tank School. Major Ralph Sasse with the British Heavy Tank, and Captain Doy David Eisenhower will be with the Tank Replacement School. But for the British Heavy Tank system, they went through training in the United States as basic recruits, and then upon completion, the initial soldiers who went over there were out of the active army. They joined the British Training School at Bovington, where they started working with early model Mark IVs, which were very similar but shorter than the vehicles that they're currently using. The American 301st was formed up and then joined the American forces in combat at the end of the war and specifically in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. Out of the campaign specifically there were a series of four primary battles that the vehicles were involved in and this particular vehicle is significant on the 29th of September 1918 in combat she was hit, she had casualties inside the vehicle and mechanically disabled to the point that she was never able to continue in the other battles. Luckily for her, that meant then that she was being salvaged and would then join the American forces returning to the United States where it came to Aberdeen Proving Ground for testing and evaluation and then was assigned back to the test and test development element out of the infantry school here at Fort Benning, Georgia. So when the tank detachment set up here, she's one of the few girls that came back with the American combat veterans to tar start training the infantry tankers that would be supporting the United States Army in the 1920s and 30s. This vehicle then spent the rest of its time at Fort Benning where it was used as a training aid as well as a backdrop for many photographs for the crews and staff that completed the training and then it went up to Fort Knox, Kentucky and joined the Patton Museum in 1940. Nine. And it was up inside the museum uh, from 1974 until it came down with the BRAC to return back to Fort Benning, Georgia. As a combat veteran, 
the British tank system is a little bit different than what the French ended up using. The vehicle is actually designed to either lead the attack with the infantry following in support or to have the infantry in front providing infantry support based upon the tactical situation. What makes her unique is the fact that she's got two sponset guns, British six-pounders, that generally are found originally on British ships. And when you look at a tank, there's a reason why there are so many nautical terms associated with the tank, because it was the British Admiralty under Winston Churchill that developed the heavy tank system. Hence, there are turrets, there are sponsets, there are cupolas, there's decks, there's hatches. All of those are nautical terms instead of those types of terms that you're gonna find used within an infantry organization. Out of that, the cannons then, which came off the side of mostly British battle cruisers, were used for close-in defense. Those were inside sponsets, and there are a pair of sponsets on the left side and the right-hand side. Normally, you either have a male with the cannons, or you have a female that has machine guns in those places. Male tanks also did carry additional machine guns as well. So while she has a pair of six-pounders in the side sponsets, she also carries eight machine guns on her. A female tank would end up carrying 10 machine guns total. She carries a lot of main gun ammunition, approximately 280 main gun rounds, and almost 20,000 small arms rounds for the machine guns that she carries. With her being leading the infantry, she can end up breaching through a minefield and has no problem dealing with barbed wire obstacles because of the design. If track slippage occurs where she is moving across no man's land and starts to slip into a shell crater or gets mired, she carries generally an unditching beam that allows her to unditch from the mud and the dirt that she might potentially be slipping on. That way then she's got good mobility. In reality, the Mark V is equivalent to what the M1 Abrams is today. It is a vehicle with a lot of advanced technology. She has one of the first generations of long-range signal systems called a semaphore. She has an internal communication system using a ship form of technology like a blow tube where the captain of the ship talks to the engineer room. She also carries a doorbell on the back end, kind of like an infantry grunt box, where the back loader engineer can actually open up the back door and talk directly to the infantry from the rear of the tank. So the tank could be the shield in an attack and the point of the spear leading the infantry through the assault or follow up behind and support by fire as needed. Male tanks had the primary mission of taking out any other armored vehicles that did come out from the German side, as well as engaging pillboxes, bunkers, and machine gun nests. Female tanks primarily deal with machine gun nests and German infantry. Two different purposes for what the tanks have in the battlefield element, and there's usually a breakdown. A normal tank carries a crew of eight soldiers inside. It is commanded by a lieutenant. This particular vehicle, her serial number is 9591, was commanded by Lieutenant Hobbs on September 29th, 1918. And in the process, he's got a driver, and a front machine gunner who end up engaging troops directly in front and steer the vehicle. He then has a sergeant or a corporal gunner in the left sponsor and the right sponsor with an individual loader working those two weapon systems. And then he is in the back turret on the Mark V star and then the rear person is a loader and again the engineer, but their primary purpose is to pass ammunition up for the gun systems to be employed. The armor protection on this vehicle is no more than a half an inch thick at the thickest part. Its primary purpose is to protect the crew against small arms ammunition that the Germans are shooting at it. Eventually, by the latter part of the war, it will become very vulnerable to anti-tank rifles, artillery pieces being shot at it, and then landmines that will disable the track. She's a very slow moving vehicle. She only moves at five miles per hour. She is powered by a Ricardo six-cylinder engine, which is mounted in the center of the vehicle. Front st station has the driver and a front machine gunner, and then you have a sponsor on the left and the right. Because of the location of the engine, the noise, the heat, and the exhaust 
all influence the personnel inside. And again, this is September of 1918, and their primary uniform they're wearing is wool. So those are contributing factors that will lead into developmental issues the Americans will look at leading towards the Mark 8 Liberty. Engine is in the front, transmission is in the back with long bars that actually shift it and control it, and then in the very, very, very back is the fuel for the vehicles. Some other elements that the vehicle has internally is she carries a set of water coolers inside, small little metal tins which hold about five gallons of water for the crew to drink. But they're also strategically located inside the vehicle near ammunition, so they help provide additional protection for that ammunition in a combat situation as well. The vehicle has no battery system, and it has a hand crank start to start her up. But she has one of the first generations of a generator that generates electricity for her lighting system. The commander also has a portable map board system that is back in the back tower with him. That in many cases is equivalent to the GPS type systems and some of the other tracking systems that are associated with the modern tanks using advanced technology for combat. The semaphore system was nothing more than a tower that came up through the top or they would end up using flags to signal each other. One of the other interesting things is some of the British heavy tank units use carrier pigeons as long-range messengers, specifically when there was a need for shifting artillery fire, they could end up having a carrier pigeon carry a message relatively safely back to the artillery to tell them to shift or to stop the base of fire. The second vehicle that I'll end up discussing will end up being an M1917 American light tank. It is an American version of the French Renault tank used by the light French forces in the First World War. Weighed approximately six ton, crew of two. A platoon actually consists of five vehicles, combination of both machine guns and cannons within a platoon organization. The problem with this vehicle is first, you've got to find the right size guys to fit inside of the vehicle. Height restrictions were five foot four and below with a weight limit of 125 pounds. Anything larger than that, the person does not fit well inside the vehicle and evacuation out of the vehicle in an emergency becomes a bit of an issue. The vehicle that we're using right now, the M1917, is not a combat veteran, but was again the American production vehicle to support the American forces if the war continued on into 1919 time period. But what I will focus in a little bit on is what the French Renault and this vehicle had in common. The male version is a 37 millimeter cannon. The shell's a bit smaller, than the shell that was in the British six pounder. When you look at it, this is an armor piercing shell. They also had a high explosive, but even the armor piercing had a nasty little surprise. It has a heavy armored casing on it, but when it is separated out from it, you will end up finding it has a base detonating fuse system and it's filled with black powder. So after it penetrated through a concrete pillbox or armor plating, the primer would end up igniting the powder in charge and you'd have an internal explosion. So very effective against armored vehicles as far as that goes. The vehicle carries approximately 78 of these and has no secondary weapon system like a machine gun. So once they're out of ammo, then they're no longer effective in a fight. Armor protection is the same as what you have on a heavy tank. It's only about a half inch thick at the thickest part. The vehicle actually relies a little bit more on its smaller size and mobility. French tactics are a bit different than the British tactics. The French employed the vehicles in support of the infantry, never leading in the fight. One of the problems that the Renaults had in the no man's land operations was they were very susceptible to the barbed wire wrapping around the track and suspension components and literally mechanically locking up the vehicle. So you had to proof a lane for the vehicle to get through generally either the night before or very early of the morning of the attack. Generally the vehicle would follow in support of the infantry and as needed the infantry would call the vehicles forward 
to suppress those targets that they themselves could not. The other problem with the vehicle is she's much smaller in length. And as the German trench system got deeper and deeper, starting in 1914 from only a trench of six foot wide to 1918, it was over 11 foot wide. The small French tanks had very difficult operations getting across the trench line system. They would be success successful at accomplishing the first line of defense, but not necessarily being able to get to the second or third lines where the Germans would fall back to and then counterattack from. The vehicle, a little bit quicker, at about five and a half to six miles per hour, still has more than enough armor protection to protect the crew inside. The particular vehicle we have has actually several machine gun impacts from 30-06 machine gun ammunition because in 1942, after she was declared obsolete, she went out onto a machine gun range to be used as a target vehicle. And when you look at the impact strikes, you'll notice that none of them penetrate through the armor protection of the vehicle. What makes this different is that it's got a driver down in the lower hole in the very, very front of the vehicle, engine is in the back of the vehicle, and the commander of the vehicle is up in the turret. Now the commander is the commander of the vehicle, he is also the loader of the weapon system, and the gunner for the weapon system. So if he's also the platoon sergeant or platoon leader, he is in a very heavily worked position within a combat fight as far as that goes. Ammunition is very accessible for him, where all he has to do is reach to his right or his left, around his knee, and he can pick up then the ammunition that's stored in the locker boxes through there. These are all gasoline-driven engines during this time period, or petrol, according to the British, and it's one of those things that the fuel source was always a very vulnerable element. Road range on this little light tank is only 20 miles out of a fuel tank of 24 gallons. So she's got a limited ability to support in a battlefield operation and normally has to be topped off the morning of the fight so that she can maximize that range. Unfortunately, in some cases, vehicles went out and because of the day of operation, were out in a full days of operation and ran out of fuel, the crew has no choice but to abandon the vehicle. Communications inside is a little bit different also. She does not have a semaphore system. She actually uses flags for communication. Internally, actually, they end up using basically foot pressure on the back shoulders of the driver to indicate turning to the left, turning to the right, or braking requirements based upon what the tank commander sees from his limited visibility inside. These vehicles are all like operating an old school bulldozer. You've got a pair of laterals used for steering, so when you pull back on the right lateral, it will slow down the right side track, causing the vehicle to turn to the right. To go straight ahead, you just keep both laterals straight ahead, and obviously you've got a gas pedal that you end up pushing on. But these are also standard transmissions, so you have to end up shifting gears forward or reverse as necessary. As the war progressed, Individuals in the United States, like Henry Ford, decided to support the American war effort. Henry Ford came up with his own design, and that is the M1918 Ford two-man tank behind me. It's almost like a little sports car in comparison with the other bigger, heavier vehicles. Weight is only three tons. Same issue with height and weight restrictions will end up requiring this vehicle to have very small crew members, and she will only mount a machine gun. When you look inside of her, okay, the two crew members sit in the very, very front with the machine gunner off on the left-hand side. Behind them will be a pair of Ford Model T four-cylinder gasoline engines, one for the left side, one for the right side, which will be controlled by the driver who's on the right-hand side. Same thing as with the light tank, she's got a set of skids on the back end to help her as she is encountering craters and other obstacles out on the battlefield to keep her from actually teetering over. There's a lot of beautiful film footage that goes into this vehicle being tested and it was actually developed in conjunction with Dorn Ironworks out of Cleveland, Ohio as far as the prototype vehicle. Originally there was a plan for 15,000 of these vehicles to be produced and to support the war effort. Only 15 were built by the time the war came to a close in November of 1918. Anticipation by the Americans was that the German resistance would continue on into a spring offense of 1919 and into the summer and even the fall, hence America was developing these vehicles. It was to work in conjunction within the American replacement vehicle 
for the British heavy tank and the American replacement for the French Renault. The next vehicle I will introduce is the American-built Mark 8 Liberty tank. Named after the Liberty aircraft engine, which is a V12 engine placed in the vehicle, took all the lessons learned from combat with the British heavy vehicles and designed it into the American version of the heavy tank. The intent for this vehicle was if the war continued on in 1919, these would be the primary vehicles that the American heavy tank force would end up operating in. War came to a close, so that did not happen. America built 100 of these. These are going to be the primary heavy tanks used for training in the 1920s through the 1930s by the American forces throughout the American continent. They will never go into combat overseas and will be used here stateside throughout the U.S. for training. And towards the end of the war, several will be sent up to Canada to help support the Canadians training as driver trainer. Unfortunately, out of the 100 that were built, only two still survive. The one that is here that came out of the Aberdeen collection and the other one at Fort Meade, Maryland, where the Tank Corps headquarters reestablished after World War I was over with. Same basic concept, an eight-man crew. There are no male and female. They're all starting off as a male element with side sponset mounted six-pounders or the 57 millimeter. The difference on this is that the engine has been removed out of the center of the vehicle and placed in the rear of the compartment with an actual firewall separating that. So the heat, the noise, and the engine and exhaust elements are not influencing factors. The commander then is in a center tower or a turret and he can talk directly to the gunners on the left sponset or right sponset as needed or the driver who is right in front of them. He also has the opportunity to employ several different machine guns that are located on the vehicle. Just like the Mark V, this vehicle carries a very heavy load of ammunition, 283 main gun rounds and 21,000 machine gun rounds for the vehicle. Speed did not change. It's still only running at about five miles per hour based upon the need for infantry support and the armor protection for the most part is no more than a half an inch thick, which was again one of the problems with the earlier vehicles and anti-tank weapon systems. But part of that development was that the vehicle had additional plans for applique armor systems, just like some American vehicles today end up employing, if they did go back into a combat situation and have to deal with anti-tank weapon systems that were moving forward during that time period. This particular vehicle is interesting in the fact that it was also here at Fort Benning, Georgia and used for training down here, mostly in the Sand Hill area in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it also was involved in a lot of other test and evaluation components for the vehicle. After it was used here, it was sent up then to Aberdeen Proving Ground for testing and to stay with the ordnance collection, and it joined us less than a year ago. The important element out of this girl, she needs a lot of restoration because she sat outside for over 97 years of her life and has a lot of needed TLC. She actually is two tons heavier at 34 tons and she is approximately 24 inches longer. Again, better to deal with the issue of the trenches and the shell craters that she might end up encountering as far as that goes. She does not have the unditching beam system that the British heavy tanks had available. She also has a full electrical system inside based upon an internal generator with a internal intercom system that's a first generation electrically actuated system versus the blow tube system that the Mark V had incorporated within it as far as that goes. The more important element though is that the crew is centrally located in that front compartment known as the fighting compartment and their coordination in battle is a lot better. She uses the same concept with the semaphore tower for long range communication, as well as backup flags, flare guns uh, for communication systems as far as that goes. But what's also kind of unique about this girl is her engine is an aircraft V12 engine. And it puts out about 280 horsepower, which is quite a bit more actually uh, than the British Mark and potentially gives it a little bit more speed but again, the gearing is geared such that it moves only at about five miles per hour, 
because its primary purpose is not for exploitation, it is to support the infantry. As we conclude this section, the vehicles that we've currently got behind me are the vehicles that America was intending to fight 1919 with. When the war came to a close in November of 1918, these vehicles never saw combat. They were used by the United States in the 1920s and 30s for training until the beginning of World War II. Then they supported World War II as driver trainers, and later on, they gave the ultimate sacrifice and were scrapped to make new tanks to fight World War II. I'm Lynn Dyer. Thank you for stopping by the shop. We'll see you next time.